Today on the show, we leave our boring nine-planet system behind, uh, Team Pluto, and take a much-needed vacay to some far-off destinations straight from the mind of Frank Herbert himself. Welcome to Gamjabar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. And my name is Leo. <laughs> Leo, is Pluto still a planet? They're bouncing back and forth on that constantly? I had to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'll say that Google autofilled is Pluto a planet 2020. Uh, so I'm not alone. People are asking. And fun fact, it is still not a planet. Ah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I'm always rooting for the little guy. So Literally, in this case, yeah. I'm on Pluto's side. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, this isn't important. Today, I'm so excited. First of all, we're back. Uh, it's been a little bit, and we've missed you so much, kind listeners. Really great to be back talking about Dune, exploring this thing that we love so much, and... So great to be back on a spoiler-free topic. This episode is spoiler-free. And as always, as people are talking about, I'm reading Dune for the first time. I'm, I'm excited to see the movie for the first time. Abu, you and I have so many conversations about how do we tell people just enough to get the most out of the story without, you know, spoiling some of that surprise of discovery. And I think today's a really good episode for that. Totally. Like, today's topic is all about the planet's that readers and moviegoers and HBO TV show, if that ever happens, watchers <laughs> right. will encounter when they first enter the world of Dune. And like you said, we're not going to be spoiling major details of these planets, but we're going to give you a strong foundation. Yeah. And you'll start to learn the names of the planets. And when you're introduced to them in the books, you can be like, hey, Leo Nabu told me about this. <laughs> yeah. I know what's up with this planet. <laughs> That's our goal today. We want you to be thinking about us constantly. <laughs> <laughs> as always, in today's episode, we're going to be referencing Frank's words, first and foremost, as the kind of primary canonical source. And then we're going to be drawing from the encyclopedia here and there to kind of fill in some of those extra fun, juicy little details. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the planets of Dune, and there are a lot of planets. <laughs> there are... There's a lot. There's a lot of them. A galaxy full of them, in fact. The, a galaxy, nearly, right? <laughs> <laughs> are we going to be talking about all of them? No. 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 None. No. We are going to be talking about a tiny, <laughs> tiny portion of the uh, around 13,000 planets <laughs> yeah. in Frank Herbert's Dune. And again, <laughs> this is not to say that 13,000 planets have been named and created by Frank himself. Right. My God. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, if anyone were to do it, it would be him. Right, but right, But he right. didn't. But <laughs> just to give you a sense of scale of this universe, of the empire that we're talking about in the Dune universe, there are around I, – I wouldn't even say around. I would say there are over 13,000 planets under the control of the Imperium, not to mention some fringe planets, one of which will come up later in the episode – that are sort of in control, sort of ignored, sort of the outer rim, if you want to make a Star Wars reference. So tons <laughs> of planets in the Dune universe. We are going to be focusing on just the handful of the most important ones and the ones that we directly encounter in the books, the ones we hope to encounter in the movies, and some of the fun, juicy, extra lore <laughs> ones that are in the encyclopedia. Which are our favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did a whole episode on one of them because that's what we do. <laughs> Okay, we're going to focus first on the sort of main planets, and these are the planets that you are going to see at some point. These are the planets where characters are, they're talking to each other on these planets, or it's like primary planets where people are from. And we've already seen a couple of these in the trailers, so we know that at least two of them are featured in the upcoming film. Mm -hmm. And of course, what better place to start than on the desert planet of Arrakis or Dune. That's right. The iconic planet, the titular planet of the series. Yes. <laughs> and we've seen so much of Dune already. If you've watched that trailer, most of that trailer took place on Dune. Right. Here are some characteristics. There's a lot of sand. 
There's a lot of sun. Very dry. <laughs> Very dry. Extremely hot. Dry sun, dry sand. <laughs> yeah. Bring your sunscreen, my guy. If you're going to yeah. go to this. SPF 6000. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Ideally, worm resistant as well. <laughs> yeah. That sunscreen. That protects you against those. Yeah. Super sunscreen. Exactly. But Dune, Dune of course, is... Like I was saying, the, the the planet. This is where most of the story takes place. This is where we suspect most, if not all, of the movie will take place. And we've already seen it in the trailer. This is also where the spice melange, you know, famous substance in Dune, originates from. This is the only place in the entire galaxy where you can get this stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the one stop shop for, uh, for your spice melange needs. Worth mentioning, right? Totally, totally. And again, if you are about to read the Dune books, if you have read the Dune books, you know this planet intimately, or you will learn the planet intimately through the movies, through the books. Right. So we're not going to get into super spoiler stuff. We're not going to yeah. spoil anything that you would learn naturally by watching or experiencing Dune the, for the first time. But as we like to do, Leo, we did <laughs> dig up some fun facts about Dune that maybe aren't directly stated within the novels or the movies. That will add some flavor and spice to your viewing experience. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> God. All right. So here's a, here's a fact. There are no seasons on Arrakis. Hey. Although I would correct this statement. There's one season and it's the hottest one. It's just. It's hot. <laughs> dry. Dry. Hot. Right. And part of this is because of the way that the planet rotates on its axis and orbits its sun. This is a direct relationship to the, the planet's orbital pattern, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Weathermen real bored on Dune. They got nothing to talk about. <laughs> Can you imagine like morning weather reports? And welcome back to <laughs> KAAR. We've got another dry, hot day here on Dune. Um, I hate my job. Back to you, John. <laughs> <laughs> and across I-95, we got another worm sighting, folks. You'll, you're going to want to avoid that on your commute. Traffic traffic reports on worms. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a good... <laughs> so beyond the seasons themselves, yeah. there is a certain type of storm that does happen. And this actually happens in the books. Yes. We've actually seen it in the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a moment in the trailer where Timmy is in one of those helicopters that we saw, the ornithopters. Yeah. And he's in this storm, this like dust storm, this desert storm. And these are Coriolis storms. And they're massive, massive cyclones that are pretty common to the surface of Dune. Right. And wind gusts in these storms, wait for this, have been measured up to 800 kilometers per hour. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Uh, wait, how many football fields is that? Uh, I didn't do the math to football fields, but for our American <laughs> listeners, which that's also us, I don't know why we're saying wow to 800 kilometers. I don't know what that is. What, how fast is that? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> is that fast? Who's to say? It is actually, and I'm to say. <laughs> I did the conversion 500 miles per hour. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking dust storms, cyclones with winds up to 500 miles per hour, and these Coriolis storms often cause dangerous sandstorms across the desert. And, you know, as as you would imagine with sandstorms, low visibility, right, right. a lot of sand everywhere in every nook and cranny, Leo, every <laughs> nook. Every one? Every single one. You're not going to get that sand out for days if you're caught in one of these storms. Oh, no. To be clear, this is like individual sand particles are cutting through steel at this speed. Yeah, 500 miles per hour. Pieces of sand are like tearing flesh from bone, you know, cutting through bone even. So this is an intense, uh, avoid them. I mean, long story short, <laughs> avoid the Coriolis storms. Right. When that weatherman comes onto the radio and says, and we've got another Coriolis storm on the way, uh, <laughs> literally close the doors, do not go outside. Uh, that's that sort of weather. Yeah. Exactly. This is, this is when you hunker down. And we, again, we saw some sort of storm in the Dune trailer. I suspect it'll be a Coriolis storm. And we see a number of Coriolis storms mm -hmm. in yeah. the novels themselves. So this is a pretty common occurrence in the deserts on Dune. And uh, our, many of our characters experience that. Sure. Yeah. Something else you might be wondering beyond, hey, Abu Leo, what's the climate like? What are some storms? The third thing you might be wondering is, it's a planet. What's the population yeah. size? How many people 
live on Dune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Earth has right now like nearly 8 billion people, right? Mm-hmm. And climbing. But Dune, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of space on this planet uh, because how many people are on Dune? Well, rough estimates say about 15 uh, million. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 15 million people. Okay. And what's interesting is a majority of those people are living in the desert. Right. There's a couple of urban areas and urban cities, small towns, where uh, a lot of traders, a lot of outsiders who aren't native to Dune come and go. Right. But a majority of the people of Dune live in the desert, have adapted to the desert, and that's something that you'll definitely encounter in Dune when you read it. And it's something we've actually seen yeah. in the trailers. We've seen those people wearing the still suits with the special nose plugs, and that's just uh, something they have to do to survive in this hot, arid, dangerous desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 15 million people roughly live on Arrakis. Yeah, crazy. You know, we're talking about Dune first and foremost because this planet is almost as important as any singular character. It kind of is a character in the story. Yeah. So there's no better planet to start with. But that's about as much as we have to say about Dune for now. Um, I'm sure we could do, you know, six or seven episodes exploring all the uh, <laughs> nooks and crannies that, that Sand gets into on Dune. <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. I'll give you that. Oh, thanks. Thanks for giving me that. Um, <laughs> but let's move on. Let's go to somewhere that is not quite as dry, not quite as desert-like. In fact, let's go to the probably like one of the wettest planets Hell. that we see in the book. Yeah. Uh, and certainly one that we also see in the trailer. Yeah. Another planet we've seen in the trailer, yeah. Kaladin. Kaladin, yeah. This is the ancestral home of the Atreides, yeah. and it has been for over 20 generations. It's a long time. It's a long time. This is where our main character, Paul Atreides, is from. Yeah. We see him in the trailer. Yeah. Walking along that beach, looking all mopey and sad. <laughs> Poor Timothy Chalamet. Very good at it. And that is Kaladin, folks. We even see Castle Kaladin for just a hot, hot second. We see this shot of a castle... Almost on a cliffside, it looks like, along the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, that is the Atreides seat of power and on the planet Kaladin. And Kaladin's great, Leo. It's it's a paradise. It, amazing. Why would you ever leave? Uh, besides, you know, plot reasons. But yeah, <laughs> no, it, it's really, it's a wonderful place. And as you learn about it, and, and what we'll tell you now is, it's it's really this kind of it's it's a it's a paradise it's it's this water rich it's a tropical planet the the climate is temperate and and perfect uh there are very seldom any major storms so also pretty bored weathermen but you know for a different reason <laughs> but for uh, for better reasons yeah <laughs> and the weather today on caladan is uh perfect i also hate my job <laughs> <laughs> I wanted that Arrakis position, get some excitement, but... <laughs> you know, grass is always greener. <laughs> <laughs> the sand is always dustier. <laughs> These poor weathermen. God. So th you pulled a quote, and I, I love I love this quote because I think this really highlights. We can talk about how temperate the, the planet is, and we can talk about how much water there is, but I think... So this quote is, We had no need to build a paradise of the mind on Kaladin, we could see it physically all around us, right? Wow. Literally, the perception is of paradise. People look around and they go, yeah, this place is perfect. This is great. That's the opinion of the person on the planet, right? Yeah, exactly. But there is a bit of a downside here. Yeah. Because the people of Kaladin, imagine living in a perfect paradise. You're that bored weatherman. <laughs> right. You're that bored office worker who uh. has to go through a beautiful sunrise every day day yeah. to get to work that's the worst the weather's perfect yeah. you're rocking your brand new jacket even though you don't need it because the weather's perfect right the people of kaladin ended up being quite soft yeah weak <laughs> which is a bit of a weird word to use yeah. but you know they, they weren't these tough and gruff survivors of a tough planet of say what the people on arrakis in the desert are like right, right. the people of kaladin were not fighters they were lovers in a tropical <laughs> paradise. Yeah. And that meant that Kaladin didn't have a standing army and they had very few to none internal conflicts. It's too nice. E exactly. Like the, it's a, it's a soft, nice planet. 
And also that speaks to how well the Atreides governed the planet yeah. and how well they oversaw their subjects. And their main source of income was whale fur from all that water. Remember, lots of oceans. Yeah. And tourism because it's a paradise. Right. Who doesn't want to come visit paradise? Yeah. It's a nice place. I just imagine two kind of opposing, arguing, I don't know, landowners on Caladan going, oh, I would fight you if the weather wasn't so perfect today. I'm going to stretch out on the beach and <laughs> right if i wasn't in such a great mood because of this sun today like yeah <laughs> i swear to god i'd murder you if it wasn't for how beautiful the <laughs> so <tempered. laughs> such a paradise planet all around us now nah, kaladin would do wonders for my seasonal depression i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty good it's a good place we saw a little bit of kaladin in the trailer right we saw paul atreides walking on the beach we saw a castle kaladin yeah I have a feeling that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're yeah. probably not going to see a ton of this planet beyond what was already shown in the trailers and maybe a couple of extra scenes. A lot of the story doesn't really take place on this planet, but it's still important to know as the ancestral home of the Atreides. And it's still important to know, honestly, that it's a bummer to leave. Yeah. Paul has to leave this paradise and go to this harsh planet full of worms and Coriolis storms. <laughs> Right. And uh, it's it's a huge bummer, which explains his mopiness. So I suspect we won't see a ton of Kaladin in the movie beyond the stuff in the trailer. But again, important to know the planet. Super important. Yeah. And even as, you know, we're going to be talking more about planets that don't ever really show up in the book. But these planets are talked about even when you're not seeing them. So again, this sort of reinforces this idea. I think it's good to be familiar with some of these places, even if we leave them early on or or even if we never see them ourselves being a little bit familiar with the vocabulary of where places are and, and kind of what they're known for gives us more insight into people's mentality if someone said oh i went back to caladan for a while it's like oh yeah that makes sense because they're you know enjoying the temperate climate and, and all that exactly exactly now i do want to say leo one place you probably aren't going to enjoy your vacation <laughs> Right. Is our next planet on the list. <laughs> Which I'm going to give you the opportunity. How is this pronounced? Because I've... Oh. I don't think I've ever said it out loud. I don't think I've said it out loud either. Okay. So in my brain... Drum roll. <laughs> this next planet is pronounced Giddy Prime. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. that's that's what I was thinking. Giddy Prime. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I've always <laughs> said it in my brain. I don't know if ever, I've ever heard anyone say it out loud. We did have a listener actually email us last week. Oh, right. With a link to a pronunciation so guide. Sorry, we haven't listened to that yet or checked it out yet. Oops. We will. I promise. But we appreciate the email. <laughs> uh, such a great email. Thank you for reaching out to us at comjabarpodcast at gmail.com. But right. Giddy Prime is how I've always pronounced it. And Giddy Prime is the home of House Harkonnen. Yeah. The bitter bitter rivals of House Atreides. Right, 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 right. From the terminology of the Imperium, which again is a section in, in Dune where Frank takes a second to kind of explain some of the terms and phrases, sort of a, sort of what we do here, but just in fewer <laughs> words. Um, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> I try to, and then we <laughs> record for two hours. Uh, Giddy Prime is, quote, a median viable planet with a low active photosynthesis range, which... Damn! That's kind of a burn, right? That's like <laughs> Absolute dunk, in my opinion. Damn! It's like median awful. <laughs> not a lot of sun. Not a lot of sun on Giddy Prime. It's not bright and happy. It's no paradise. It's dark. It's bleak. Yeah. You know, it's the Shadowlands that Simba looks at and goes, what about... What is that? And... And Mufasa goes, oh, that's Giddy Prime. It's terrible. <laughs> we don't go there. Right. We don't go there, Simba. Never go there. <laughs> Never go there. <laughs> yeah, it's really, the, the planet is described, like you're saying, dark, bleak. And another word that's always attached to it is industrialized. Yeah. yeah. It's a heavily, heavily industrialized planet. There's a, a section in the encyclopedia that describes oil sort of running and seeping through the soil because there's so much industry right i imagine lots of pollution right a lot right. of air pollution i imagine giant factories and billowing gusts of of gaseous fumes trailing up into the air 
that's how I picture Giddy Prime, and I'm interested to see how it's interpreted in this upcoming Denny Villeneuve film, because the 1984 film had a vision <laughs> of sorts. Of many things. And you may or may not have liked it. I certainly sure. appreciated it. It yeah. tried to go grand. It definitely hit on the industrial vision of it, right? It was very metal. Right, right. Lots of beams and lots of lots of industry and factories. And that that's how I imagine the new movie will go as well. And that's pretty much the basics of how it, how the planet is described. And what that means is because this is the planet of House Harkonnen, right. who are the quote-unquote bad guys and the rivals of House Atreides, uh-huh. who are the quote-unquote good guys, mm-hmm. it means there's a lot of subjugation happening on this planet. Yeah. There's a lot of industry and there's a lot of, a lot of workplace <laughs> rules being broken constantly i imagine i mean again this is the house that uses slaves right yeah so yep again the weather report for giddy prime is (laughs) medium to light oppression you know (laughs) uh, which is maybe to say severe oppression yeah seven days a week 365 days a standard year which i I don't think that actually applies on this planet because uh days are long and, and years are longer uh but yeah, it's a it's a it's a good home world for the big bad boss, you know, the, the 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 evil evil dudes. Right, right. I almost imagine a capitalist dystopia of sorts. Mm. Almost something like yeah. Blade Runner, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like futuristic, gritty, dark, potentially a lot of neon lights. Like it it could potentially be like a cyberpunky world, but of course it's also terrible. A lot, and a lot of cyberpunk is dark and terrible and gritty also. So that's sort of how I imagine Giddy Prime. And I imagine the people who come to this planet by choice are the folks who just love busting unions and exploiting their <laughs> workforce. It's the best. It's the best. <laughs> I mean, if if those are things you write down for your hobbies, yeah. <laughs> you're going to love Giddy Prime, baby. We we got a we got that by we got that in droves. Long walks on beaches violating uh workplace <laughs> safety is really fun really love that yeah and again the the sort of significance of giddy prime being this way is it also reflects house harkonnen right right kaladin right. is a paradise because the atreides are good people there are heroes giddy prime is this capitalist dystopian wasteland because the harkonnens are are corrupt evil individuals and we shouldn't be rooting for them so obviously the planets are to also symbolize the houses themselves and our characters. Interestingly, and I, man, this might be a little bit of a longer conversation than we have time for right now, but going the other way, you know, looking at causality in the other direction, if you have a planetary duke who is like values the people's experiences and believes in human quality of life, mm. it could lead to a healthier, kind of better planet to live on. Totally. Versus. A family line like the Harkonnens who are like, oh yeah, people's experiences don't matter at all. And what matters is that sweet, hard cash. Yes. So let's just ring this planet for what it's worth. Surprise, the planet gets ruined (laughs) and is a bad place to be for everyone except for that top hashtag 1%. Totally. So Bezos is clearly a Harkonnen. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Not really. (laughs) No, you may not stand by that, but I do. (laughs) I kind of stand by that. We're on to you, Bezos. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. The the inverse is also totally true. The planet reflects the house, and the house reflects the planet. Right. And whoever's in charge definitely dictates that as well. So these these are two very important planets. And Giddy Prime actually comes up in the book more than Kaladin. Yeah, that's true. So I suspect that Giddy Prime will be somewhere we actually get to visit. Maybe not in this film. Right. Hopefully, fingers crossed in future films. But uh, Giddy Prime becomes a very important planet in later books, and it'll be very cool to see see it on screen. Man, if a planet reflects the house in charge of it, what does this next planet <laughs> say about <laughs> House Carino? <laughs> Because the next planet we're going to is terrible, and we've actually talked about it a few times. If you've listened to our our spoiler-free episodes, you've heard this planet's name thrown around and trash-talked a little bit uh, on on this podcast, on this very podcast. Right. Seleucus Secundus. Seleucus Secundus. 
That's if you have listened to all of our episodes up, up until now, that's a very familiar term to you. You know this planet, you've heard us talk about it. In fact, two episodes where we where we went pretty in depth on it was the Sardaukar episode. That's where we really got into it. Right, right. And then it also came up briefly in the Animals of Dune episode because there's a lot of scary animals that come <laughs> from this planet. So yeah. those are two other episodes. If you're interested in learning more about Seleucus Secundus, highly recommend checking those out as well if you haven't already. But let's briefly, Leo, maybe just reiterate yeah. The absolute horrors of this planet, you know, refresh everyone's memory. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Uh, this planet is terrible. Uh, super, <laughs> super bummer. Super bummer place. Resources, barely any. Almost no resources. Temperatures yeah. uh, range from a chilly, a little bit of a, a chill in the air, negative 45 degrees Celsius, which... Oh, boy. What is that in football fields? One second. Uh, negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Negative 50 degrees. Bring your long underwear, folks, because that is a <laughs> cold day. The, okay, I really just want to do the weather people for every planet now. Absolutely. This poor guy on Seleucus Secundus, rip. <laughs> just, he's actively being hunted by Laza Tigers as he's trying to tell you the <laughs> weather report. He's always in the field, and it's always terrible. But here's the thing. Negative, what was that? Negative 49 degrees Fahrenheit, right? The hot side of this 60 degrees Celsius, which is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Negative 50 to 150 or 140 degrees. That's a wild temperature range. Dang. What a range. Yeah. These temperatures and these scare, scarce resources means that only the strongest survive. Right. Only the strongest plant life. Only the strongest animals like Laza tigers and Raya wolves. Right, right, and right, right. only the strongest people. Right. Yeah, the, the survivability of young people on Seleucus Secundus is partially determined by, like, having a strong immune system and being healthy and, and I don't know, having a lot of vitality as a, as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about softies from Caladan who, you know, no. used to the sort of lovely temper. No, no, we're talking about seasoned, hardened people, including... So soldiers and and we we talked about at length in a spoiler free episode the sardaukar which are the fighting force of house carino and they are training in the craziest environments right those negative 49 to 140 degrees fahrenheit like crazy training on Seleucus secundus right imagine how brutal that boot camp is <laughs> tough yeah tough and we've actually seen sardaukar in the trailer yeah they're the people in the white armor who are rappelling down from the ships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Sardaukar, definitely big players. And now you know where they come from. They come from Seleucus Secundus, right. this absolutely brutal, brutal planet. Now, another important thing about Seleucus Secundus, before we move on, is that it's actually the homeworld of House Carino. Right, right, right. And House Carino is the house in charge of the empire. Yeah. The emperor is of House Carino. So you can imagine how they took over considering the brutal homeworld they came from. These guys are tough. They're built tough for <laughs> F-150 or something. Like, <laughs> it's where those are manufactured in Dune. The Ford F-150 <laughs> is built on <laughs> Solusticandus. <-Sikandus. laughs> now, something interesting here is once they took power, once House Carino was like, cool, we rule the galaxy now, we're in charge. <laughs> right. They don't live there anymore. No. Like, they picked another planet that we're going to mention a little later on in the episode. They moved the capital of the empire to another planet. Seleucus Secundus now is their prison planet. Right, yeah. Every war they fight, prisoners get booted to Seleucus Secundus. Oof. The Sardaukar warriors, the best of the best, get trained on Seleucus Secundus. So right. it's still right. a very useful and important planet for House Carino. They just don't want to call it home anymore. <laughs> they're, they're moving up in the world. Listen, yeah, I get it. I get it. If I was in this galaxy, I would also not want to live there. So, you know... It's it's a it's an understandable move to make. So those those planets that we just talked about, Arrakis, Seleucus Secundus, Caladan, and Giddy Prime, are by a margin the most talked about and visited and seen planets in in the Dune franchise. But they are by no stretch of the imagination the only planets. And so we're going to talk now about sort of our second tier, uh, sort of secondary planets, which. We don't see much of in the books, or or we probably won't see much of them in the movies, but they are 
they're really, they're prominent, they're important. They come up in discussion somewhat yep. frequently. And, and it's just good to know about these places because, again, as characters are talking about these planets, it is good to have sort of that understanding of, okay, planet X, this is the place where technology is made, right? So let's talk about planet X. Yeah. So as the name implies, Leo, X is spelled I-X. Right. Which Roman numerals is the number nine. Yeah. And the encyclopedia, interestingly enough, actually mentions that as language evolves in the Dune universe and moves on, Roman numerals were forgotten. And this planet must have been named back when Roman numerals were still a thing because it's the ninth planet from its star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But people have forgotten now. So now they just call it X. <laughs> to be fair, the iPhone X came out like three years ago and we had people calling it the iPhone X day of oh absolutely so <laughs> even if people remembered what roman numerals are there still would be people going planet x what is planet x <laughs> planet x planet x <laughs> yeah just call it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true you're totally spot on that's a, the iphone analogy is perfect there so <laughs> x nine people just call it x it's a lot easier yeah, and the people yeah. that live on this planet are the ixians makes sense and this cool. planet is important yeah because after the Butlerian Jihad, which is something we have covered before, if you don't know what that is, listen to our Timeline of Dune episode. We go to great lengths to explain this pretty significant event in the history of Dune. Right, right. After that Butlerian Jihad, the Ixians became really the main source of high-tech gadgets and technology. Yeah. And it's because they often skirted this line <laughs> yeah. of a ban on artificial intelligence. And they they knew that they were skirting that line. Yeah. Like, they knew that they were doing things that most of the universe would not really appreciate because it, it, it's kind of tempting fate in a, in a galaxy that has very recently felt the sting of we took technology too far. Yeah. So they kind of purposefully remain secluded and hidden. They kind of hide themselves and don't really try to put themselves on anybody's radar for years and years and years and years and years. And years. Until the formation of the Spacing Guild. You know, again, this really pivotal moment in history. Mm -hmm. This is when they finally kind of reintroduce themselves to the Empire after kind of playing with their technological toys on their own in their own little corner for so long. Right, right. And and a big factor in that was they realized, oh, no, the Spacing Guild <laughs> yeah. means people can travel. There's interstellar travel again, right? Right. Which means we may have been a secluded, quiet planet on, you know, the edge of the galaxy for a while. But now people are going to visit. They're going to find our technology. <laughs> yeah. And they're either going to be mad at us and attack us, or they're going to subjugate us and take our technology. We need to do something before those two scenarios happen. Right, right. So they took this preemptive first step, and they approached the Empire. They approached the Emperor, and they showcased their technology and how useful it could be. And the Emperor, honestly kind of turned a blind eye to them sort of skirting the rules with artificial intelligence because this technology was incredibly useful yeah. and i imagine shiny and cool you know like <laughs> yeah so they struck up a deal in that way and honestly probably saved themselves from some sort of annihilation or subjugation by approaching the emperor and enticing him with their cool gadgets and their shiny new shiny new iphones <laughs> yeah the iphone x <laughs> uh. otherwise known as the iphone 9 <laughs> This is also the reason we're talking about Ix is also because to your point, Abu, the shiniest and most useful gadgets are the most sci-fi elements really of this world. And as you go into watching the Dune movie or reading the Dune books, as you see technology that seems pretty futuristic, it is a pretty safe bet that this technology is from Ix, right? You see that hot new smartphone, Ixian. The, the Keurig uh, coffee thing, mm -hmm. Ixian. Now, surgery to add extra arms to your back so you can, like, steal things from the people around you, that's that's more t like Toy Laxu. Definitely. Those fuckers. <laughs> those, those assholes. <laughs> those dirty <laughs> bastards. But as you're stealing from the people around you with your extra arms, the Bluetooth earpiece that you're using to, like, listen to your hot jams on your Ixian smartphone, that's made in Ix. <laughs> that's Ixian. Yeah. Definitely. I'm hoping that we'll encounter some Ix Ixian technology in the movie. And I'm sure we will. There will be some advanced... It's a sci-fi movie, right? It, it takes place in space. There will be some advanced technology, and you can almost bet that it's from Ix. And whether or not it's directly acknowledged in the movie that it's Ixian, 
will know. Yeah. You and I will know, Leo, and our listeners will know. Just adds that depth to the watching and reading experience. So I mentioned them. Abu and I love to dunk on them because, frankly, they're awful. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's talk now about Playlax. Yes. Planet Playlax. And home of, drumroll, the Tleilaxu. Hey. Boo. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> They're ugh, annoying. I imagine at some point yeah. in the galaxy, like once they hit like 10,000 planets named, they were like, we're done naming planets. <laughs> we're out of names. Yeah. Who lives here? Tleilaxu? Great. Your planet's called Tleilax. <laughs> Don't write about it. You, you know, like we call it Earth, but we're humans. Technically, we live on planet human yeah. humanian or earthian <laughs> yeah like i don't know i just find it funny that eventually someone somewhere in the galaxy yeah. gave up on naming planets <laughs> and just <laughs> i guess it would be like huma like if this planet was huma Ooh, we'd be humans i kind of love that huma planet huma yeah anyway back to Tleilax. <laughs> so Tleilax, the home planet of the Tleilaxu. it is earth-like it is the planet is described as earth-like actually yeah in many ways covered in assholes <laughs> <laughs> so very earth-like actually spot on right yeah and there's not a whole lot of description of Tleilax, and we certainly won't see it in this first movie it would be a shock right. to see Tleilax in this first film it comes up in the novels and that's why we're talking about it it's very important because the Tleilax who are such important characters and a hugely important faction in the dune universe you can learn more about them in our Factions of Dune episode. Definitely talked about them quite a bit. Right. But their home planet is not described in much detail, and all we really know about it is that it's Earth-like. We also know that there's a holy city called Bandalong. Yeah. And this city is reserved only for Tleilaxu natives because the Tleilaxu are assholes and they're xenophobic and they're <laughs> honestly like sort of extremists, like religious extremists and zealots. Like yeah. the Tleilaxu yeah. have nothing good going on is what I'm trying to say. For all of the cool technology that the Ixians introduced to the galaxy, the Tleilaxu are the source of a lot of biological changes and enhancements, and right. they they introduce a lot of stuff. A lot of genetic mutations, stuff like that. Yeah, like steroids would be sort of a thing that the Tleilaxu would be behind, right? Yeah, totally. No, you're totally right. If the Ixians are sort of the Silicon Valley of the universe, if you want to imagine that way, they bring out the shiny gadgets and they're tampering and playing with artificial intelligence when they maybe shouldn't be. That's Ix. Tleilax is the crazy dude in the country who's like cloning sheep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and mutating, like, sheeps and dogs into new types of animals. Like, that's Tleilax. They're, they're tampering with biology. They're tampering with genetics, while Ix is just creating shiny new gadgets. Those are the two types of technology in the Dune universe, and these are the two planets and the two people right. that make those types. Now, the last thing that I wanted to say about Tleilax is we don't know a lot about them on purpose. <laughs> they are very secretive and this is partially because of their xenophobia and their their hate and distrust of everybody who's not part of the Tleilaxu culture. But we don't know a lot about the planet. People in Dune don't really know a lot about it. Yeah. But they are certainly talked about, so we had to talk about them today. They're, they're not giving up the secret recipe to clone <laughs> sheep. Although we keep asking. You got to buy it from them. They charge a high price for us to clone our sheeps. So going from Tleilax, we are now going to... Lampadus. Lampadus? Lampadus. Uh, Lampadus is how I said it, but now that I'm saying it out loud, it. Lampadus sounds know. like a delicious food <laughs> from South America. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> give me some of those Lampadas. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. I mean, it sounds. Mm, drizzle it in some. <laughs> give me. I'll take three, like right now. It sounds great. <laughs> the, the ones with the honey nuts on them, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So in the Dune universe, not a hypothetical treat that Leo and I just made up. <laughs> it's it's a planet. Yeah. And we there's, again, not a whole lot to say about this one without getting into some potential spoiler territory. Right. But what we can say that's not spoiler is Lampadas was the original location of where you've heard this name if you've listened to all of our episodes, where Gilbert Albon, Albi, Albi, Albi. This is where he opened the first Mentat school before eventually, as we talked about in our Mentat episode, moving it to the planet Tleilax when he cut a deal with them. 
Lampadas is where it started, where he started that first Mentat school and raised that first batch of Mentats and trained them. So that that's a pretty interesting anecdote for Lampadas. And later on, once Gilby leaves, Lampadas becomes a site for the Bene Gesserit. They have a Bene Gesserit keep on it. And in later books, it's the, it's the site of a, a pretty major battle in Chapter House Dune, which is actually the final book that Frank wrote, the sixth book in the series. Again, I'm sort of tap dancing around spoilers here and walking on eggshells because I don't want to say too much. But right, Lampadas right. is a planet that you should recognize and you should know as well because it, it will come up in future movies. And if you're reading through the series, right, it right. will come up in future novels, in the later novels. I like that we call Gilbert... Albans, both Gilby and also Alby. <laughs> we have effectively established two very cute nicknames for someone who historically is like significant, but I don't Genius. know if I would attribute yeah. the word cute. <laughs> <laughs> Moving from there, we have, I think I wrote this one down. And again, I don't know how to say it. Tupile. Tupil. Tupil? Oh, interesting. I T pronounced it Tupil. Tupil. Oh, I like Tupil. That's better. It's T U P I L E. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Gamjabar Podcast at gmail dot com. <laughs> Email us if you have strong <laughs> opinions on how to pronounce to peel. But to peel uh, is interesting. Uh, I didn't remember it even remotely before doing the research for this episode. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned a few times in the first book. Yeah, yeah. Like some of the planets we're going to talk about, you have to like search to find where some of these planets are mentioned. Tupil is mentioned a couple of times and for good reason. Yeah. This planet is effectively the witness protection planet. <laughs> and it's actually, it's probably a small cluster of planets. Like it's probably a small, tiny part of some really remote system somewhere. But this is a small collection of planets, probably, that only the Spacing Guild knows where it is. Yeah. And, and you say probably because... It's kept that way. Yeah, it's kept yeah. very much under wraps, and nobody except the guild can get you there. Yeah. It is really the planet you go to if you are exiled from the Imperium. If you got debts and you got to run, baby, pay the guild and get out of there. Right, this is right. this is the planet where you go to be exiled. <laughs> and quite frankly, it kind of sounds great. Like, it's like if someone's trying to murder you or if you're in trouble with the emperor you got on his bad side— Pay the guild and just go hang out in Tupil. Right. <laughs> and people talk about it. Like, people know about this place. They don't know where it is, of course. Yeah, it's like an open secret. Yeah. Yeah. Even, you know, one of the main characters of the book says, quote, a handful of spice will buy a home on Tupil. And I, that's more of a comment, I think, on the value of spice. But it also reflects then the price of a place on Tupil. <laughs> Yeah. Equivalent to saying this much crude oil will buy you a house in the Hollywood Hills or something like that. Like, that's kind of how it reads for me. Is that how you see that quote? Yeah, I, I think that quote, I think the intention of that quote is to kind of explain how rare and precious spice is and how much it's worth that, that it could buy you an entire house. Yeah. We might be reading right. too much into it, which is extre extremely <laughs> on brand for us anyway. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think you're right. You know, I'm kind of in that tax bracket of small apartment on Tupil. Uh, I don't know that I would go full house on Tupil. <laughs> right. Not rich blood enough to, to own a house on Tupil. I'd, I'd really, I'd rent. I'm a <laughs> exactly. I mean, you you got to budget the cost of the Spacing Guild getting you there too, you know? Like, that's not easy. That's not cheap. You know, Abu, if this podcast gets us into like hot water with someone, do you want to go have these on like a getaway home in Tupil? <laughs> Totally. Totally. You know what? It can be a studio. It's fine. Oh, yes. You know, we can afford a studio on Tupil. <laughs> we just got to get out when all these potential sponsors that I'm shitting on <laughs> don't sponsor us. And in fact, send us cease and desist. We can get out of here. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm Sounds sorry, great. Ford. I don't know anything about trucks. <laughs> sorry for shitting on. Sorry for shitting on your F-150 or whatever. <laughs> I'm sure the big executives at Ford listen to every episode of Gumball. <laughs> <laughs> To peel is actually something that we should potentially put a pin in for now because I was doing some Spacing Guild research for yeah. a future potential episode about the Spacing Guild that we're working on. And to peel is very directly connected to the Guild and has a history with the Guild. So there's more to come about to peel. I think there's a history there that Leo, you and I have to dive into. 
Oh, sure. And we'll, we'll probably cover that in our Spacing Guild episode. So TBD <laughs> on more to peel. I think there's more here than meets the eye. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about the final kind of third tier, less prominent planets. And these are sort of honorable mentions. We're going to get through these as quick as we possibly can, which is not saying very much, perhaps. For us, is like another two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> but they, they do have some significance in uh, human humanity's history. They hold a special place in the universe uh, and also, of course, our hearts. Yeah, I like these. I like these a lot. These are some of my favorites, I think. Yeah, and some of these aren't even mentioned in the novels. And we may or may not see them in the movie, but it's a very, very low chance we will. But again, we want to bring them up and kind of go through them as rapid fire as we can. Right. Uh, mostly because for some of them, there's not a whole lot to say about the planets, except for maybe one or two quick notes on them. But they will be on the exam. So you better familiarize yourself. Take notes, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I see you on your phone, Dan, sitting in the back row. Wait, we should... We should keep track of which of our friends listen to this and then name characters after them. Oh, that's good. Or some of our listeners. Hey. Listeners, hey, if, you, if you want us to, like, at gmail.com. <laughs> just send us your name. Yeah. Just in the subject. <laughs> a, a, like a creepy, empty email with just your first name. <laughs> and we'll start incorporating your name into the podcast. I hate that. That's weird. That's very weird. <laughs> maybe, maybe say hello and tell us what you like about the show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about these planets. First up, we have a planet called Old Terra. Heard of it? We may know what this planet is because it's Earth. Baby! Baby! (laughs) It's Earth, man. Love it. It's it's where I spent my whole life so far. You know, it's a solid place. Yeah. Very Earth-like, this planet. (laughs) Deeply attached to this one, Old Terra. Yes. So actually, this is important. You might be watching Dune and you might be like, wait, right? where's planet earth we keep going to these places called kaladin and arrakis and giddy pride but yeah where's earth like why aren't there humans on earth yeah there's a reason old terra effectively doesn't exist anymore yeah it got hit by an asteroid yeah rip rip earth and at this point humanity had already mostly relocated off earth yeah but the planet got hit by an asteroid and then was salvaged into honestly like a planet-sized national park of sorts yeah like 400 years later yeah. yeah, like hundreds of years, centuries later, the planet was salvaged again, what history that could be gathered from Earth was, and then the planet was turned into sort of protected territory. Yeah. And that's why we won't see Earth in the Dune series. It's because no one lives there anymore, it was destroyed, and now it's protected land. Right, 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 right. Next up, we have Kite, Kitane? Kite, Kitan. Ooh. I was so confident going into that first syllable, <laughs> and then, uh, Kite, Kite. Uh, Ky- Kitan. How do you say that? Kitan. K- Kitan sounds right. Kitan. Kitan. Uh, okay. Kitan, which is the capital planet of the Carino Empire. So we mentioned House Carino. They've led the empire for, God, nearly 10,000 years, haven't they? Yep. Yep. And after they took power, they got the hell out of Seleucus Secundus because it's a terrible planet. <laughs> uh, again, prison planet. Now it's a it's a training ground and a place where terrible animals are raised who are just all angry all the time. And they moved to Chiton, which I personally know almost nothing about. Right? What? What? Is there anything about Chiton? That's it. There's only one bullet point. Uh, all I wrote down was it's the capital of the Carino <laughs> Empire. <laughs> That's all you need to know, folks. <laughs> One, I guess, sort of factoid I could add to this is that, weirdly, Kitan makes an appearance in the 1984 film. What? Does it? Yeah. Oh. Do you remember at the start of the film? There's This is like the very start. It's the first thing, and we're getting that monologue from Irulan. The fade-in eyes that just... The, the fade-in, fade-out <laughs> monologue. Yeah. There's also a shot after that where Paul is on his, like, iPad or whatever, <laughs> flipping through planets... And one of them is chitin. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so there's a, there's a little chitin Easter egg. So I'm curious if we'll get another chitin Easter egg as sort of a reference to both this important planet in the universe yeah. and also a reference to the 1984 film. Well, you know, again, it is the home world of the family that rules the universe. So yeah. 
This is like where the White House is of the Empire, you know? Yeah. So I, I could see that. That would be a good thing to like seed into the background of something, right? Like a, a planetary chart or something like that. That would be pretty good. Yeah, just for you and me, you know, and whoever is stuck going to the theater with us. <laughs> Sitting between us. Like that <laughs> tiny little Easter egg. Psst. <laughs> <laughs> That's chitin. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's it's the capital of the Carino Empire. Heard of them? Because <laughs> I have. <laughs> No, look, look, look. They're, they're from Salusa. Secundus. We'll probably see that in a bit. Boy, it sucks. <laughs> Next up, we have Ikaz. One Ikaz. of my favorites. We talked about it. We had a whole episode. An entire episode. Oh, it's great. I love that episode. It's so much fun. Spoiler free. Yeah, really proud of that episode. Definitely go check that one out for more details on ECAS. But again, we love ECAS. It's such an important planet to the universe. Right. It's very much in the background. Yeah. A lot of things come from ECAS or a lot of things that are referenced originated from ECAS. But again, it probably won't make an appearance, unfortunately. It would be a... I would scream if ECAS made an <laughs> appearance in the movie. In, in the theater, I would scream. But ECAS is a very important planet. It's the home of things like the microorganisms. Oh, my favorite. That oh. power the lights in all of Dune. If you see a floating light, a glow globe in a scene. Yeah, we've seen them. Wait, you're right. We've seen one in the trailer. <laughs> yeah. That's from ECAS. There's little microorganisms yeah. in there that light up in oh. the glow globe. They work so hard. I love them. So there's your ECAS connection. We literally have already gotten one in the trailer, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get many more. Yeah. So the next planet we want to talk about is Junction. And again, Spacing Guild has come up multiple times in this episode, but Junction has another connection to the Spacing Guild. Junction is the headquarters of Spacing Guild operations. Yeah. And like to peel, it is possibly a term that refers to like multiple planets and like orbiting objects it's not exactly a planet in the same way that these other things are there is a there is sort of a main planet of junction mm -hmm. before we talk about the planet really briefly i did want to say we don't see it <laughs> mentioned mm -hmm. not once at all i did a search of the first five books not mentioned once until book six so if you're a betting man <laughs> yeah it's not shown up in the movie don't bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But the thing is, I wish that I had been told about Junction early on, before I read the books, before I saw the movie, because Junction is the headquarters of the Spacing Guild. The Spacing Guild. Yeah. The, the, the thing. All space travel. This is their headquarters. And although it's not super important, and although we very clearly don't see it really for a long, long, long time... When we finally hear about it and see it a bit, I really felt caught off guard. Like, oh my god, did I miss this place when it was mentioned, obviously, in the first few books? And it just wasn't. Yeah. So, I wanted to talk about it really briefly here. Just let you know, this is a place. And this exists. Uh, you can kind of picture it. It's mostly planet side it's like mostly a giant airport <laughs> again the spacing guild is like an intergalactic trucking operation they move people and things around the galaxy so yeah, yeah. it's like a bunch of truck stops <laughs> a lot of utilitarian buildings not a lot of like fun designs or fun decorations it's mostly like ship maintenance landing takeoff zones for highliners the kind of big ships of the dune universe and really the question i have abu is how many annie's pretzels do you think they have on junction <laughs> like <laughs> a lot or like a ton you know <laughs> on every block just every block of junction it's just another yeah every, everyone's got one of those punch cards i used to have one actually really where you get the rewards yeah. you get the rewards points and eventually you get ten, a free pretzel pretzels. yeah <laughs> Yeah. And Cinnabons. Just, uh, oh <laughs> the entire planet God. is subsists on <laughs> pretzels and Cinnabons. Do you think we're hungry? Yeah. First Lampadas <laughs> is a delicious treat. Now we're talking about <laughs> pretzels on Junction. Uh, it's around dinner time. We're definitely hungry. <laughs> All right. Let, let's blow through this last planet. Wow. Bad phrasing there. You out of this planet without telling me. I did. So I'm just now reading this. <laughs> and that's amazing. So yeah. our final planet here on our, on our list of planets that will probably never show up. Yeah. But they're super fun to talk about. Yep. Is Gamont. Yeah. I thought. Gamont. Gamont. 
uh, Gamont? Gam- Gamont? Gamont? <laughs> <laughs> so many ways to say these places. All right, Leo, tell us about Gamont because you sprung this on me. Okay. The phrasing is <laughs> – go ahead. Just tell us. Oh, God. <laughs> I just wanted to say this planet comes up twice. It's mentioned twice in six books. And this is the <laughs> – this is the description from the terminology of the Imperium. I'm having trouble not just smiling my way through this. It is uh, the third planet of Neoshi uh, system, noted for its hedonistic culture and exotic <laughs> sexual practices. Hey, <laughs> I mean, come on, folks. How can we not talk about Gamont? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Man, what happens in Gamont stays on Gamont. Am stays I right? Stays on Gamont. <laughs> oh my god! This is the this is the Vegas of the Dune universe. People are like, oh my god, I'm gonna go on a bachelor party. All the bachelor parties in this universe <laughs> happen on Gamont. Oh my god, that's so funny. I'm so glad you added that planet, ladies. If you hear that your boyfriend is going to Gamont for like a weekend trip, yeah, you have to have a talk. <laughs> talk to him. Something's going on. Go with them. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Have fun, guys. Like, what? Go to Gamont. Yeah. Blow off some steam. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> what a fun planet. Oh, the best. I-, I love a good, I love a good sex crazed. I mean, again, to be clear, this is the sort of planet I would expect to be like a fun addition to the Dune universe from some other author. No. Frank Herbert was like, you know what this universe needs? <laughs> yeah. Gamont. <laughs> a sex planet. Needs a sex planet. Whole universe needs a sex planet. Look. Come on. It's in the it's in the terminology of the Imperium. It's also mentioned twice. Love it. You love to see it. <laughs> Show us your freaky side. Frank. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that wraps up the planets we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Obviously we have left off around twelve thousand plus <laughs> planets that yeah. we haven't touched on, but some of these are very important. Some of them, like Gamont, are just fun. Some of them are literally the MVPs of the universe, like Ekaz. But all of them, yeah, Dan, indeed, will be on the final. Mm-hmm. So I hope you all take good notes. But to wrap up, we always like to end our episodes on some fun questions. So, Leo, I have a question for you. Yeah. Of the planets we've talked about on today's episode, sure. which one are you most excited to see come to life in the film, even if it's one that's not likely to? Ooh, um, you know, we've talked about a few places that could be pretty good. Um, I think, you know, I really hope and pray that we get like a cutaway shot on ECAS. Yeah. Because, I mean, just as a very quick reminder from the ECAS episode, seasoned space explorers saw this planet, told their seasoned space explorer friends about what they saw, and their seasoned space explorer friends were like, you are high on drugs. That's not a place that could exist. I want to see that. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to see yeah. a cutaway shot that gets the entire audience to ask questions about the home of my precious ooey gooey microorganisms. I love them so much. Absolutely. And speaking of high on drugs, so many drugs come from so ECAS. Ma- it's the place where all the drugs are from. Show us it, <laughs> Denis. <laughs> yeah. Make it happen. That would be very cool to see on It'd screen. It'd be so great. That would be a next level Easter egg. Great. I would love to see it. What about you? What What is your kind of number one place that you want to see on the screen? So I mentioned this a little earlier in the episode. For me, the pick is Giddy Prime. Oh. I want to see this industrialized, dark, dreary world. Yeah. And I think the reason I want to see it, we've seen it once before in the 1984 film. Yeah. That was one direction to take it. I want to see what the mind of Denny Villeneuve brings to the screen and how he interprets this planet, which is really this capitalist dystopia ruled by these horrible, horrible people, this horrible house. And I, I think Arrakis is the obvious answer that comes to mind, but it's <laughs> right. mostly sand. Like, it, we're just, gonna, it's a lot of sand. <laughs> right. yeah. I think Giddy Prime has the opportunity to be really interesting <laughs> and distinct and have its own character to it. And, and also, you know, we know we're going to see arrakis like we know we're going to see a ton of that Mm -hmm. so saying like i'm excited to see that yeah of course we are yeah and we know we're going to this is more i think what do we hope makes it in totally even if it's not necessarily the most important place to see well okay so here's here's then a more kind of visceral question abu 
if you could vacation on any planet for a whole month, mm. where would you go and why? Mm. I mean, I wrote my answer down before you added Gamont to this <laughs> script. <laughs> I know. It's true. So I'll go ahead and say my original answer, okay. but I think we all know what my true answer is. <laughs> Okay, my, my original answer to this question that I wrote down was, actually, you would think Kaladin would be the go-to here. Yeah, yeah. But I don't like water. I'm a bad swimmer. Okay. <laughs> I like. I, I don't want to ever go on a yeah. cruise, you know? Like, sure. Don't, don't take me on a boat. I f- firmly like my feet planted on Earth. Mm, okay. So Kaladin is actually a no-go for me as far as vacation planets go. Yeah. I would probably maybe do something pretty vanilla in the Empire and go to K-10. Okay. The seat, of, the seat of power. I imagine it's also the cultural center of the empire, you know? Like, everyone across the empire comes to Ketan for trade, for politics, for everything else, you know? For vacations, probably. Yeah. So, Kaladin is maybe something someone would have to drag me to, or there'd have to be, like, a really cool free cruise that I won in a raffle or something. <laughs> but k is somewhere I'd probably go willingly, just to see the seat of power. It would kind of be like visiting your nation's capital, you know? You would get to see the cultural hub of your nation, and in this case, empire. You know, and as you're talking about it, I realize House Carino is super wealthy. I mean, they've been in power for 10,000 years. Yeah. You can imagine they've decked out their home world. I bet it's so beautiful and clean and yeah. very as Ixian as it can be. You know, I imagine they have all of the conveniences it really probably is one of the best places to get a sampling of life in this Dune universe. That's a great answer. Yeah, that's solid. Yeah, thank you. Totally. I mean, Gamot is actually my answer, but... Do you see my answer? I do. You just wrote Gamot four times in all caps. <laughs> Only two. Only two times. Oh, sorry. Oh, I see. The other caps text here is hands down. <laughs> Listen. I also added Gamont after I wrote my answer. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I changed my answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you not, for a month, go to the, like, sex craze planet? Okay. Well, okay. Moving on. To, to reiterate, <laughs> hedonistic culture of exotic sexual practices. Word for word. That's how Frank put it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Kind of. Mom. I would say, actually, really kind of a, an honorable mention in a place that we didn't we didn't even talk about but it came up in the fremen episode i think kind of an honorable shout out to portrin yeah because portrin is described as all around a nice beautiful planet and it's this hugely significant planet in the history of the zinsuni wanderers so i think i think that would be really nice but you know my my actual answer especially from the planets that we've my actual answer from the planets that we've talked about is uh gamma no no, no. <laughs> is uh it's probably caladan although we've talked about some pretty good places yeah i think caladan because you know i'm i'm a scottish dude <laughs> i feel like the oceans and the rain and the beautiful weather and yeah. again they've got a lot of tourism so i feel like they have the infrastructure to support a really comfortable month you know right Again, there's probably going to be good hotels and, like, good places to stay. There's probably some guided tours. Great travel guides, tours. exactly. Maybe translators, if I don't speak Gaelic. Right. (laughs) The language of Dune. So I feel like Caladan is is my place because I like the water. That's a good answer. There you go. But, again, you've nearly sold me on going to Kaiten. That's a a good idea, too. (laughs) Well, hey, you know what? We can go to both. Yes, we can. And then and we'll stop off in Gammon. <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll, we'll tell the wives that we're um, uh, we're just going to go get cultured in Kaitan and then relax a bit in Kaladin and uh, makes a couple of, no- of other pit stops on the way. Come on. And, and we'll be back in a month. Just like a little boy's trip. <coughs> Come on. <laughs> Actually, here's a thought. I realized also. I bet Old Terra would be pretty nice to visit. Yeah. Like, we don't we don't talk about it or see it, but imagine our current planet with no people. Maybe I'm, like, exposing myself as an introvert, but, like, <laughs> <laughs> no people, just all forest. Wouldn't that be nice? It's like a big, big old park. That could be beautiful. Yeah. No, that would be great. 
That's probably the most boring possible answer. <laughs> no, no, truly. If you're like a nature person and it's protected land, so you know it's like curated and taken care of, and there's history there, right? Like you might come across some Roman ruins and be like, I don't know what all of these letters mean. Is it X or is it X? <laughs> We'll never know. We'll never know. We'll never know. It's a mystery <laughs> lost to time. But can you imagine saying, oh, we've got 13,000 planets to explore. Which one do you want to go to? Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm a homebody. I'm, I'm used to Earth. I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't even go outside in real life. <laughs> Well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic, so help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lore Party Podcast Network on loreparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, he who controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the Golden Path. Welcome to Seleucus Secundus Radio. This is Bob the Weatherman. There's a Liza Tiger chasing me at the moment. I am remaining calm and not making eye contact with the creature. It is currently a brisk negative 34 degrees Fahrenheit, folks. Be careful on your walks to work today because, wow, there's a lot of Liza Tigers. There's a pet. So many. Uh, Jeremy, uh, should we get to the van? Keep doing the weather report? Okay. Are you sure? There's like six of them now. Well, we expect tomorrow's temperatures to be... <laughs> Signing off forever. Bob the Weatherman. Rest in peace, Bob. They have to get new Weathermen every every segment. Man, six Laza Tigers. Is that... Yeah. <laughs>